exciting papers for you this evening. What we'll do is we'll gather questions for the end of the papers. So if you'd like to pop them in the chat box, I'll make sure to make a note of them. And both speakers can, uh, both sets of speakers rather, can set, uh, can respond to those at the end. So our first paper this evening is by Peter Gary with the title, We Thought It Was New York, The Communal Narrative of the Cork Jewish Community. Peter is currently completing a PhD at the Department of Near and Middle Eastern Studies at Trinity College in Dublin. He has been an associate of Holocaust Education Trust Ireland since 2012 and has taught on the summer programme for teachers and also led study visits to Poland, Berlin and Israel. He is also a museum teacher fellow at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in 2017 and 2018. So I just want to remind everybody, it would be great if you could stay on mute during the course of the paper. And as I said, if there are any questions, just pop them into the chat box and we'll get to those towards the end of the session during the discussion. Okay, thank you very much, Peter, take it away. Okay, good evening, everyone. Nice to see you all. Thank you for joining me tonight. Um, uh, thank you to Tony for the introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen in a moment with you. Um, I have some pictures to show you and um, some slides relevant to my PowerPoint tonight. The first, um, I'll open it there. I think you should be able to see my um, my PowerPoint now. Um, the first slide I'm going to start with is a, an article from the Jewish Telegraph in Manchester in 2016 called, uh, as you can see, Cork, Jews thought their new home was New York. Since I started my PhD nearly six years ago now, this is what I hear wherever I travel to interview people, be it in Ireland, in Cork, in Dublin, um, in England, in London, in Manchester, in Scotland, in Israel, in the States. Invariably, this anecdote that uh, Jews arrived mistakenly in Cork and thought it was New York is told to me. It features continuously in biographies, autobiographies and testimonials of uh, former members of the community and also neighbours and non-Jewish neighbours of the community of Cork. Just when I think it has finished, it resurfaces again. So that's why I'm starting with this picture to, um, to show you that it's, it's ongoing prevalence. The Cork Synagogue, which you can see in this picture here, um, was completed in the, early in the early 20th century. It held its last service in February of 2016 before being deconsecrated and sold. Following the sale, the synagogue in Cork became a Baptist church. At the time of deconsecration, there were less than 10 members um, of the congregation, obviously not enough to form a minion. During the service, Morris Cohen, the chairman of the Jewish Representative Council of Ireland, spoke. He said, um, we know the story that they got off the boats because they thought Cork was New York. They left the ships due to the ruthlessness of the ship's captains. Another influx, influx came a few years later, a smaller influx. The main wave of Jewish immigration, similar to Dublin, came when the Jews arrived from Acme, fleeing Russian oppression in the late 19th century and they formed a small congregation here in 1881. The history of the Cork Jewish community is a story based on this communal narrative that has been repeated, repackaged and reduced continuously over the past 150 years. It is a communal narrative, as we will see, that is based very much on persecution, escape and, as I've said, accidental arrival. It, has come to define the Cork Jewish community and it has even reduced the Cork Jewish community um, to these all too familiar tropes. Um, it has been preserved and perpetuated not only by former members of the community but by their descendants, their non-Jewish neighbours. There are many, there are numerous examples of this communal narrative and um, I will now read a short sample of them to show you, to give you um, a picture of the narrative that um, appears constantly in relation to Cork. The first is from an autobiography from a former member of the community who has since, he has since died. He wrote, my father was born in Prekele, Lithuania in 1884, the same year the GEA was founded. The GEA is the, the Gaelic Athletic Association in Ireland. And when he was six years of age, he and his family emigrated from Lithuania, which was at the time Russian territory. 
the immigrant Jews of Lithuania believed that they were journeying to the new world of America, but instead they were put off the ship in Ireland and they came to live instead in the Emerald Isle instead of the next parish, America. Another um, former member of the community said to, told me the story that was told to me as a youngster as to how the Jews or most of them arrived in Cork was that around 20 or 30 of them, men and women, decided the men had to avoid the draft. In the Tsar's army, there was a draft that, that started at the age of 18 and went on to the age of 35. So these youngsters went to a port on the Baltic. I think it was Stettin. They found a ship who the captain told them was going to New York. They did a deal with him asked a price, but of course they wouldn't be able to eat the captain's food. So they went into town and loaded up with salted herring and potatoes and after the ship sailed, and after two weeks they arrived in Cork for refueling, etc. But when they asked the captain, where are we? He said Cork, and they understood it to be New York, and they all got, got off. They all thought they were in New York. That's what I was told, you either believe it or you don't. The majority of them didn't set out for Cork, but the first few that arrived here, it is said that the captain either took their money or threw them off or told them they could rest here while they took on provisions. Or they were sick, or they were poor, or they had no money. It was said they could row across to America if they rested here for a couple of days. Well, when he got to Hamburg, he said he wanted to go to New York. He found a ship's captain who said he was going to New York and he would take him. He took his money and off they sailed. They landed him in Cork, so he wrote to his friends back home, come to Cork, come to New York, it's called Cork, laughing. So um, here you can see a selection of, the, um, of what has been written over the years by many uh, members, former members of the community in both biographies and autobiographies of the Cork Jewish community. It features also as the main part of the exhibition on the Cork Jewish community in the Cork City Museum in Fitzgerald's Park. I would like to state that it is not the aim of this presentation to cast doubt um, on the memory of those former members of the Cork Jewish community. However, it is the aim of this presentation to show a more complete uh, history of the Cork Jewish community, a community whose history is considerably more nuanced and complex than the reductive community of narrative would, would lead one to believe. Despite the over-reliance on the communal narrative of escape, persecution and passivity, the testimonials nevertheless give us an insight into the more complex and even ambiguous arrival of Jews to Cork in the final decades of the 19th century and the early 20th century. Words like Acme, Lithuania, Russian territory, Tsar, and New York, which resonate in the testimonies and portrayals, all form part of the more complex story that, that is the arrival of the small group of Jews to Cork at the end of the 19th century and at the beginning of the 20th century. I will now speak to the more complex grey story behind the arrival. At this point, it is important that I start with geography. As many of the testimonies, and as we will see, details in both the census of 1901 and 1911 highlight, the majority of those who did come to Cork and settle, albeit for a short length of time, came from um, Achmeny or around Achmeny, a small shtetl in Lithuania, not far from the border with modern day Latvia. Both of these countries were at the time part of the Russian Empire and situated in an area many of you will know, know as, was, that was referred to as the Pale of the Settlement. As we have seen, violence, persecution, and fear feature um, throughout the testimonies we've seen. However, as I said, geography is important here. This area in the northwest of the Palis of Settlement, which you can see on the map I have put to you on my screen now, on the top right in an area called Courtland, the top of the arrow, in the northwest of the Pale of Settlement, was largely unaffected by the violence of the pogroms, which occurred sporadically throughout the 19th century in Tsarist Russia. The majority of the pogroms were centered around Odessa, at the other end of my map, the other end of the arrow, in the south of the Russian Empire, some 1,200 kilometers away from uh, the Shtetlach in, um, in Cortland, from which the majority of those Jews who would settle in Cork originated. We cannot deny that there was certainly fear and undoubtedly violence. The pogroms for those who did settle in Cork were not the main reason for immigration. The second thing when we think of the ultimate um, arrival of Jews to Cork 
we had need to think about the economic conditions at this time in, in the Pale of the Settlement, and in particular in the Northwest area of the Pale of the Settlement. Uh, within the Pale of the Settlement, there were just under 3 million Jews at the end of the 19th century, or approximately 12.5% of the population. The economic position, uh, conditions for Jews, while always poor and precarious, worsened steadily after the emancipation of Russian, Russian peasantry in 1861, and the construction of, ra of railways throughout the Russian Empire. The Jewish population in the Pale of the Settlement in the northwestern part, as in in other parts, uh, continue to rise as our job opportunities continue to sink. Many functions and positions originally associated with Jews, such as teamster services, petty trade, and peddling in the countryside, were becoming obsolete. The pale of settlement became choked by a huge, pauperized mass of unskilled or semi skilled Jewish laborers whose economic condition continued to worsen. Consequently, emigration became a way out of this economic, of these economic difficulties for many Jews. Um, let us briefly come back to conscription. Conscription features in many of the testimonies as well. It should be stated that the worst excesses of conscription were removed after the Tsar Alexander II's accession in 1855. This was more than two decades before the rise of mass emigration, in particular, the arrival of, of uh, a group of Jews to Cork in Ireland. Let us return again briefly to my the first uh, feature of, of emigration to Cork, geography. As we can see again, Acmeny, the location of Acmeny in the northwest of the, settle, of the Pala settlement is important. While it was, as you can see in my map, 1,200 kilometers approximately from Odessa, which was the center for pogroms, it was 120 kilometers um, from the port of Libau in modern day um, Latvia. Um, the port of Libau, unlike its neighboring ports of Riga and St. Petersburg, did not close each winter when the ice closed much of the Baltic to sea navigation. At this stage in the latter half of the 19th century, fierce competition began between the shipping companies. Competition pretty much similar to the competition between low cost airlines in, in our times. There was huge competition on the shipping lines, on the shipping lines from Europe and Russia to the New World, America, um, Canada and uh, South Africa. Migration became big business. It is important to say as well that the transatlantic fare from um, to the New World, to America, was some two pounds cheaper from England than it was from Rotterdam and, Am and Hamburg. Consequently, there was a large number of trans migrants who traveled through Britain and ultimately Ireland. It was consequently cheaper to break your journey in Britain and Ireland before ultimately traveling on to, um, to America. The Castle Line, which is, an, uh, here you see an advertisement for the Castle Line, which would merge ultimately with the Donald Curry shipping uh, line to form the Union Castle Company, published this ad in Hamlet's newspaper in 1895. The ad shows um, in Yiddish that the Castle Line offered cheap passages to Cape Town, Johannesburg, and all places in Africa, as well as kosher food. Departures from Libo by passenger ship to England and from there to Africa on the mail boats of the Castle Line would be possible from the port of Libo. There were at least two vessels that sailed each week from Libo, weather permitting, to Hull in England and to London. Um, Audrey Newman, the historian Audrey Newman reports that in 1909, for example, some 15,000 Jews sailed um, from Libo in, in 1910 some 19,000 uh, Jews, and in 1911, some 17,000 Jews. So we can see again how important geography is in the arrival of Jews, not just to Ireland, but also to Britain. Uh, the port of Libau made this uh, immigration a lot easier for Jews in the northwest of the, of the settlement. At the same time as the port of Libau developed, the railways in Russia and throughout Europe grew hugely. 
the in 1880, the, the rail line between Romney, which near Poltova in modern day Ukraine, to Libau opened. The line ran through some of the most populous areas of the Pale, including Gomel, Minsk, and Vilna. The economic opportunities made the port of Libau a magnet for internal uh, economic migrants and uh, merchants living in the Pale. The Jewish population of Libau alone grew from 19 in 1795 to just under 15,000 some hundred years later. So consequently, the opportunity to leave Russia had now reached all of those in the northern half of the Pale of, of the settlement and the districts surrounding Libau. While the journey was long, it did not include a border crossing, nor did it necessitate, inter necessitate interaction with border officials or overland alien lands. Jews situated in this Baltic port provided their food and lodgings in a port, as I said, some 110 miles um, from the province of Kovno, from um, the area of Acme, where, the, where those Jews who settled in Cork were from. While a passport was often required, the gendarmes uh, policing across the port were as open to bribery as anywhere else. Furthermore, immigration from Libau did not require a uh, rigorous medical exam, an exam that had been in place in Germany since 1895. And relatively speaking, the sailing from Libau to Hull um, or to London, as you can see in the map here, was relatively quick, three to five days. So in addition to the growth of the uh, shipping lines and the fierce competition that existed on them, which made um, immigration a reality for many of those Jews living in the, in the Pale of the Settlement, and in particular in the northwestern part of the Pale of the Settlement, um, the growth of railways in Britain also facilitated the mig migration of Jews from Cyrus, Russia, across the country, across Great Britain, and ultimately to Ireland. According to David Cesarani, the increasing volume of Jewish transmigrants reaching Liverpool from East Coast ports, notably Hull and Grimsby, followed the inevitable completion of the rail uh, network linking the two coasts in Britain from the 1840s. From the 1850s, mass immigration uh, from Liverpool um, grew substantially. As I mentioned earlier, you can see the rail line passed through the Stettloch around Achmene, direct to Libau, where the ships could then be uh, taken to from Libau to reach Britain. Here on the, on the slide I have here, you see advertisements again for the rail lines which were created, completed in the 1840s from Hull and Grimsby across um, to Liverpool, as you can see on the map here. The port of Liverpool's um, importance grew in the 1840s as the premier port from the British Isles to the, to the New World. Again, um, another step along the journey was to travel to Ireland, to travel to Dublin and ultimately to Cork, where Jews would settle for a number of years, some for longer, some would settle for a number of years before ultimately traveling directly from Cork to, to America. It is estimated by the, uh, Tony Kushner that yeah. between 120,000 and 150,000 Jews uh, uh -huh. settled in Britain and ultimately Ireland. Um, half a million of uh, Jewish uh, trans migrants spent approximately two years in Great Britain and Ireland before moving on to the New World. Hazia Diner also talks about the importance of the railways in Britain and Ireland. Um, of creating new opportunities for these trans migrants. Realities as a result of the growth of the railways suddenly beckoned in the more sluggish regions of Great Britain and Ireland, in regions such as Ireland, Scotland and Wales. We should briefly look at Ireland's economic position at this time as well. Following the devastation of the famine and massive Irish emigration, rural Ireland had changed hugely. Um, the population film had thinned out, remittance from relatives working abroad flowed in, and farm workers earned higher wages than before. These economic factors in Ireland stoked material desires. With the arrival of, um, of uh, the uh, Jewish peddlers to Britain and Ireland, there was a developing rural market. 
people had more money than before. So the arrival of peddlers in rural Ireland was seen as something welcome. We have discussed the, the growth, the importance of the shipping lines, the railways as reasons as to how um, Jewish, uh, commun a Jewish community came to settle in Cork. However, it should be also mentioned that the housing policy of Angle Jewry is also worth noting at this stage. Due to the mass arrival of thousands of Jews, um, primarily to London, uh, Sir Samuel Montague, um, hoping to deal with the issue of overcrowding the East End, extended his network of synagogues into the provinces. The poor Jewish temporary, self, uh, temporary shelter could select promising families who wished to stay in Britain and Ireland and move them directly to provincial cities and not London. Consequently, we see support for the Cork Jewish community coming direct financial support coming from, from, from Sir Samuel Montague in London. Let us go back again uh, briefly to the um, accidental arrival. Competition on the seas for passengers, as I said, was huge. It was often cutthroat. Conditions on the ships were bad. Ships often broke down. The Jewish Chronicle in 1891 uh, refers to two stricken liners, the Eden and the Dumbledam. Both of these liners were towed to the port of Cork for repairs. The Jewish Chronicle of 1891 refers to approximately 100 uh, Jewish people aboard these uh, ships um, leaving the ship and disembarking in Cork, where they appealed to their brethren in Cork for financial aid. A general meeting um, of the congregation uh, was held in, um, in, in 14 Eastville on Sunday, January the 29th, 1899. The notes of the Hebrew congregation of Cork state that the honorary secretary reported that the disabled, disabled steamer Alessia with 28 poor Jews on board entered the harbour early last week and by direction of the president wired the chief rabbi and Sir Samuel Montague for assistance to relieve the poor Jews on board. Sir Samuel Montague replied that he will guarantee a sum of 10 or 20 pounds provided there are sufficient number of Russian Jews on board to require it. It subsequently turned out there weren't enough, so he justified his refusal in, in consequence of the exaggerated report he'd received from the president of the Cork Hebrew community with regard to the number of Jews having stated to have been 50 instead of 28. So, what do, we, what do we see from the census of both 1901 and um, 1911? The census of 1901 in Cork notes that there were 426 people uh, listed as being Jewish. 192 of these people stated that they had um, uh, been born in Russia or the Russian Empire. 28 had been born in England. 29 had been born in Dublin while one approximately 141 had been born in Cork. So this, the census again shows us that the arrival of Jews to Cork was not direct from Libau or other ports in mainland Europe. It was via the UK. It was via mainland Britain where members settled briefly, had children as we, as we will see before continuing their journey to, to uh, parts further afield in the British Empire, such as Cork and Dublin. The census of 1911 um, shows us something similar. This time there are 401 entries. Uh, we see here that there are 173 people who were born in, in Russia, while 159 were born in Cork, and 37 in England, and 17 in Dublin. So again, we can see um, that the community often started elsewhere before arriving in Cork. If we take two houses in Cork at the time of the 1901 census, 10 George Street in Cork, we see the family Cohen lived there, Hyman 42, Esther 41. They were born Hyman in Russia, Esther in England. He was a tailor. They had seven children born in England, one child born in Cork. Similarly, three, Grafton, three Graf, uh, Grafton's Alley, the Refkin family, Morris, 35, Bertha, 29, born in Russia. He was a commission agent for clothes. One son, son born in Russia. One daughter born in Scotland, two children born in Cork, 
another two born in Limerick. And here we see the Cork children are older than those in Limerick. So not only did they travel via Britain, but also they settled elsewhere in Ireland before ultimately settling in Cork. The model school records of Cork, which wasn't the Jewish school at the time, but it was in, located in the area in Cork where lots of Jews settled, an area that became known as Jewtown, um, shows again this. We see the first entry for Solomon, age eight, father, a, a, a paper dealer, his last school was Belfast. What's interesting here as well is the parents' occupation. Most of them are listed as dealers. A dealer is a agent, which is often a nicer way of saying um, a peddler. So we can see again the how much the how the, the commune uh, the arrival of the community of the Cork was was done in stages, was done over time while they had settled in other parts of Britain before ultimately settling in Cork. Once they settled in Cork, we see from the census and from the minutes of the Hebrew congregation that it was very much a community in flux, a transient community. We have an entry on 1901 that says the president, W. Jackson, tendered his resignation as president in consequence of leaving Cork for America. W. H. Levy, the treasurer, also tendered his resignation on his leaving Cork for South Africa. His resignation was accepted with regret. In the 1901 census, again, we see uh, the Bloom family, 30, uh, Ellie, age 30, Sarah, 31, three children born in Manchester. They lived um, in Eastville in 1901. However, he tended, Reverend Bloom attended, uh, attended and tendered his resignation from the office as he'd been appointed in the same capacity as a Myrtle Tidwell, Tidwell Hebrew congregation. So we see this constant going and coming between Cork and other peripheral and small communities within the UK, and obviously, ultimately, immigration to America. The Jewish Chronicle also gives us an insight into the community. The small ads, for example, again shows this transnationalism. We see in 1899 an ad telling, announcing the marriage of, of Leah Klein, the second daughter of the Reverend, and Mrs. De Harris um, of Birmingham to Isaac Klein, the only son of Mr. and Mrs. Harris Klein, 21 Anglesey Street, Cork. Um, we see later, much later, the diamond wedding anniversary of Dr. and Mrs. Uh, Burkhan, formerly of Cork, now living in Jerusalem, marriage solemnized in Glasgow in 1925. In August 1916, we learned that Dora Horowitz, age 16, of four Moncray Terrors, had passed another examination in singing. In 19, uh, sorry, that should be September 9th, 1927, Percy Bremson of the Christian School Sullivan's Key gained one of the scholarships offered by the city commissioner to primary schools. He was the first Jewish boy to win a scholarship. His brother Ray had passed the intermediate certificate with honors. In 1930, Sidney Rosal of 58 Patrick Street had won the silver, silver medal for advanced senior violin at the Fesh Kjol, so a music competition in Ireland. So these small ads are important because they show us that the connections the members of the core community had with other communities in Britain. You know, they place these ads out, out, of pride, out of pride to inform friends and relatives of their life in Cork. So we see from something as simple as a small ad in the Jewish Chronicle, the connections that existed between what is often seen as a, an outlier community, Cork, with other communities in Britain. Again, we see Essie Mann, 94 Dunor Terrace, won a gold medal in the junior violin competition. So before I finish, um, we, I will give maybe one of my final words to perhaps one of the most famous members of the Cork Jewish community, Gerald Goldberg. In 2001, in the Jewish year, he wrote, the, Jew the present Jewish community in Cork City appears to be at most about 85 years in existence. Some years ago, the writer had a conversation with a centurion member of the community who died at the age of 103 and was among the community's earliest inhabitants. This old man remembering the first evening when a party of Jews arrived in Cork and lodged in a street not far from a, a Catholic religious community. When news among the inhabitants that Jews had arrived in the city, there was a general movement 
by a friendly, good-humoured but curious crowd who'd never seen a Jew and required an inspection of the visitors. They're clamouring for the Jews to show themselves. Um, sorry, I'm just signing my notes. Um, they're clamouring for the Jews to show themselves. It was misinterpreted by these newcomers who believed that their last hours had come and they spent their time praying and preparing for the end. Finally, someone sent to the Catholic community nearby and a generous, kind-hearted Catholic clergyman came and dispersed the well-meaning crowds. Why am I finishing with this? Because as I stated at the beginning of my, of my uh, presentation, the arrival of Jews in Cork was influenced by many factors. It was a community shaped and defined first and foremost by migration. It was shaped and defined by events not only in Russia, and in Europe, but also in Britain. It was shaped and defined by events such as the uh, competition for shipping on shipping lines, the development of railways, and usually by the economic conditions that the people experienced where they lived. However, in recent times, it has been reduced down to something as, um, as basic as they arrived by accident, which renders many of those who did come to settle in Cork as passive rather than active agents in their own lives. And as we have seen from the ads in the Jewish Chronicle, those who did settle in Cork, albeit for a short period of time, um, thrived in Cork and became uh, members of the community and fully integrated in the life of the city and the surroundings. It is often said the Cork community was an, anom an anomaly, a mistake from the beginning. For the, as we've seen, however, there is many reasons for believing this narrative. How it is in fact difficult to disprove, as I have shown you the accidental arrival with ships breaking down, people being put off because the ships had been to be repaired in Corkport. However, it is, as I hope you will have seen from my presentation, a somewhat facile understanding of the origins of the Jewish community that, as I said, was very much shaped by events not only in the British Isles, but those in Europe and in Cyrus, Russia. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Peter. Okay, if anyone has any questions for Peter, if you'd like to drop them into the chat box, we can come back to those after our next paper. Our next paper then is about Jewish lives and Scottish spaces. We have Dr. Hannah Holtschneider from the University of Edinburgh, Dr. Phil Alexander from the University of Edinburgh too, and Dr. Mia Spiro, University of Glasgow. Hannah Holtschneider is the PI and Senior Lecturer in Jewish Studies at the University of Edinburgh, UK. She's the author of The Holocaust and Representations of Jews, History and Identity in the Museum and German Protestants remember the Holocaust, theology and the construction of collective memory. Phil Alexander is the postdoctoral research associate and his recent PhD explores the relationships between performance space, cultural identity and musical meaning amongst klezmer practitioners in contemporary Berlin. Mia Spiro is the co-investigator and lecturer in Jewish studies um, theology and Religious Studies at the School of Critical Studies, University of Glasgow. She is the author of Anti-Nazi Modernism, The Challenges of Resistance in 1930s Fiction. And they are going to speak to us now as a trio, and we're very much looking forward to hearing what you have to say. So please take it away. Hi there, everybody. Thank you for having us. I think we're really excited to be part of this presentation. Um, I'm going to start out with talking about um, the walking tour, Jewish Edinburgh and Foot, uh, trying to inspire you to come to Edinburgh and maybe uh, visit it and uh, walk it yourself. Um, and I'll be followed by Phil and then by Mia, who will both, both be talking about Glasgow. So this walking tour takes you on a journey uh, across the past 150 years from about 1800 until the 1950s. Um, so I take about 10 minutes to introduce you to the shape of the tour and to give you an overview of its main features. When you can travel again and visit the places, you can walk the tour yourselves with the help of the app Curious Edinburgh, 
that gathers historical walking tours and links to further information. You can also virtually walk it online if you feel like it. Uh, we begin the tour on the high street. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but this is where it says high street. As this is a landmark of Edinburgh's geography that already tells you a story about the history of the city, and it helps us to locate Edinburgh's Jewish residents within the larger story of Scotland's capital. The old town was the heart of the medieval city with its high tenements known as lands and its narrow alleys known as closes. By the time the first synagogue was founded in 1817, the old town was becoming increasingly overcrowded and insanitary. A new suburb was established on the north side of the castle after the Nurloch, which is now Princess Street Gardens, was drained. The aristocracy and the middle classes were abandoning the old town for the open spaces and large windows of this new town. From the founding of the first synagogue by 20 families in 1817, community growth was at first slow. In the 1841 census, we can identify about 50 Jewish households in Edinburgh, amounting to about 155 individuals. Of those, only eight households lived in the fashionable new town area, north of the castle. The others settled in the district of St. Leonard's on the south side. Towards the end of the 19th century, as the economic and social conditions in Eastern Europe worsened, many others took their places, as we can see on this graph. Going back to, oops, change slide. Going back to the time before the first synagogue was founded, we can identify 18 Jews in the register of aliens that foreigners were obliged to complete in 1794. Among them was Hyman Lyon. He and his wife lived in the Canongate further down the high street from here. He is famous for two reasons. The first was his book of over 400 spe pages, Spina Pedum, Important Discoveries in Chiropody. And the second was his purchase in 1794 from the City Council of Edinburgh for 17 pounds of a plot on Carlton Hill as a burial ground for himself and his wife. The mausoleum still exists, but it was lost for many years until in 2013, it was rediscovered buried under the slope behind William Playfair's 1818 observatory that you can see on the slide. However, this was never a community cemetery. The first Jewish communal burial ground is located on the south side of the city. We then stop at the corner of Drummond Street and the Pleasance to mark another step in Jewish migration into the city. This is the beginning of the south side. As the community expanded in the years between 1880 and 1914, the years of the great westward migration of Jews from Eastern Europe, the south side of the city became the place of residence for most immigrants. This is the threshold to what one Howard Denton described in his memoirs as the happy, happy land. The possibility of irony in this designation was not lost on Denton, who was born here in 1914 as Hyman Jolte. Bustling with people, the soundscape would have largely yielded Yiddish accents. For Denton, the happy land largely signified closeness and familiarity living peacefully cheek by jowl with the indigenous Scottish population. Richmond Street, St. Leonard's, Dumby Dykes and the Pleasance was a home in which many adults remained all day, conducting their professional lives close to home or to which they returned from their train journeys as traveling salesmen. For others, this area was a slum, many residents living in poverty. The small cul-de-sac that of East and West Adams Street leading to the back of St. Leonard's nursery today is all that is left of North Richmond Street. The first synagogue in Scotland was established here in 1817. The Jewish community rented a room in a tenement in Richmond Court at the corner of 22 North Richmond Street. This consisted of about 20 Jewish families, most of whom had come to Edinburgh from Amsterdam and other European cities. It grew slowly at first, but in 1868, it moved to a larger premise in Park Place, about half a mile away and near the Edinburgh Students Union on TV at Place today. The synagogue in Park Place was considerably larger and could accommodate 95 men and 50 women. From 1879 to 1919, several synagogues opened and shut on the south side, accounting for the arrival of many Jews from Eastern Europe and their different approaches to Jewish religious practice and to their communal differences to the anglicized Jewish population who had arrived a century earlier. By 1907, a total of four synagogues existed and during a visit from London, the chief rabbi called on the divided community to unite. However, this only happened under Rabbi Salas Deichis, who came to Edinburgh in 1919. The different communities eventually came together, not least because of declining numbers, 
and a purpose-built synagogue for all the Jews in Edinburgh was opened in 1932 in Salisbury Road near today's Commonwealth Pool. Our next stop is this lovely bench at the Meadows. But this was not always the Meadows. For a long time, it was a loch, a pond. In the 16th century, the loch's primary purpose was water supply for the city. But by the 17th century, the waters had begun to recede from overuse as much by the brewers as by the citizens of Edinburgh, to such an extent that the area surrounding the water began to be used for grazing animals. And this area surrounding the loch began to be called the meadows. As the water became muddier and muddier, an effort to drain the loch completely continued throughout the 18th and 19th centuries, until it was fully drained by the middle of the 19th century. Cattle, horse and sheep were grazed on it well into the 20th century. Prior to the opening of Salisbury Road Synagogue in 1932, all those who had moved south from St. Leonard's were required to retrack their route across the meadows to reach their respective shores. And once Salisbury Road Synagogue was opened in 1932, the meadows still had its uses, particularly on Shabbat and festivals. The meadows was a place for the young to meet on Shabbos afternoon and for the elders of the community to sit and to gossip. At the end of a cul-de-sac Millerful place, you can see Sheen's primary school. Until the founding of Calderwood Lodge Primary School in Glasgow in 1962, there was no Jewish school in Scotland. All Jewish children attended mainstream schools, either schools run by the local authority, such as Sheen's, which had a large proportion of Jewish children, or private schools, such as George Watson's College. After World War I, Hebrew classes for Jewish children in Edinburgh were taking place in Sheen's school on weekday afternoons, the education board of the city offering the facilities of the school to the Jewish community free of charge. Sheen's primary school marked a huge social divide in the Jewish community. The school stands at the edge of the Grange, which some Jews might have aspired to at the turn of the 20th century, but few would have reached until after World War II. For those of more modest means, the Marchman tenements to the west of the school provided a solid, good, uh, good solid housing, a great improvement over the old quarter on the south side. Malcolm Rifkin, the former Scottish Secretary and Foreign Secretary, grew up in Marchmont in the 1950s. Today, the community is dispersed. Gone is the desire of most of those attending synagogue to walk to it. Although there is still a perception amongst Edinburgh's Jews as to the areas that remain Jewish and which areas are distinctively non-Jewish, but this is lodged more in nostalgia than in fact. The walking tour ends deep in the south side at Salisbury Road Synagogue, a building designed to reflect the significance of the Scottish capital's Jewish community. In 1932, the synagogue building was complemented by a community centre on the opposite side of the road. This was sold off in the 1980s as the community continued to shrink. The 200 years since the founding of the first synagogue in Edinburgh have seen the community grow, change and decline. Currently, the three religious Jewish congregations in the city are all collaborating in cultural activities that aim to ensure the survival of the community and embrace demographic and religious change. Thank you very much. I will end here and hand over to Phil. Thanks, Hannah. Um, hi, everybody. It's very nice to be here and uh, presenting. We're going to move from geography to sound now. I'm going to move from the physical plane to the oral plane and uh, if I start sharing, uh, we're going to listen in on some sounds of Jewish life in the earlier part of last century. Can you all see that slideshow? Hopefully that's going to play from the start. All right, can someone just give me a nod that you can see, see that? Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I'm going to start with a story from the Aberdeen Daily Journal from 1908, entitled The Difficulties of Yiddish, and it reads as follows. A bill printed in Yiddish was last week exhibited in many Glasgow shop windows advertising a Jewish dramatic sketch. A correspondent of the Glasgow Herald writes that the other afternoon he overheard a conversation between two old Scotch worthies who had been studying the announcement. Well, John, said one, can you make anything out of it at all? No, nah, well, was the reply. That fair beats me the new. But, man, he continued, 
If I had my fiddle with me, I believe I could play it. Okay. I can't see a reaction. You might have hated that joke. I like that. But what does it tell us? What does it tell us about Scottish musical, Scottish Jewish musical interactions? Um, it tells us that for both cultures, music can be found in anything. Um, it speaks to a kind of implicit uh, musicality in the Yiddish language, but also an implicit ability um, of Scots to uh, to uncover that parallel musicality in their own world. It speaks to the centrality of the fiddle to national cultural identity of both cultures, and we're going to look at that a little bit more in a second. Um, it tells us that Jews are weird, <laughs> but also musical. Uh, perhaps these two are connected. Perhaps there is something musical in Jewish weirdness um, in the other countries, you know, where they're speaking their strange languages and playing their strange music. Um, it tells us that music is a common language, unlike written spoken language. In other words, uh, these two old Scotch worthies and the people who are putting on uh, the dramatic, the Jewish uh, sketch that Playbill is advertising are able to communicate on some level, and that level is a musical one. In other words, it tells us that both Jews and Scots are able to think, react, and live through music. Now, they're not the only ones that can do that, but this is what we're talking about here today. And we're going to look at two more examples of this now. This uh, are two reports written uh, really just in a couple of years apart of um, celebrated fiddle players, one from Shetland and one from Berdichev in Ukraine. And I'm going to read them both. Have a listen to the similarities of these descriptions and particularly how um, these musicians seem to kind of encapsulate the spirit of their people, as it were. Okay, the first comes from Shetland uh, and it's from an article called Yule Time in Shetland by an old Shetlander published in Chambers Journal in 1881. Fredeman Stickle, a very prince of fiddlers, summoned from over the hill for the occasion, talking about a wedding, they're both playing for weddings, these fiddlers, was elevated on a chair on top of the dresser in the ample kitchen. My uncle's splendid Stradivarius fiddle in his hand and dancing began. I have a vivid memory of Freddy sitting on his elevated perch, his head thrown back, his bright light blue eyes sparkling and his handsome, mobile and expressive countenance beaming with smiles of delighted excitement. The man's spare but lithe and sinewy body seemed to be transformed into a musical machine, and the music was the most inspiring of its kind I have ever listened to. It was irresistible. And now this is from Shalom Aleichem's description of Stempenu. Stempenu is a fictional character but is based on the real-life Berdichev fiddle player Yossela Drucker. And Shalom Aleichem writes, Stempenu poured out his soul through the fiddle. He seemed to be melting away out of existence, as if he were wax before a fire. And, now and again, he seemed to come back to earth again, from his soarings in the blue vault of heaven. A hand flying swiftly up and down, no more than this was to be seen. And yet, one heard all sorts of sweet sounds. A thousand delicious melodies and arias filled the air. So once again, we have a parallel going on here. Both of these men, both of these celebrated fiddle players, both playing at a wedding, seem somehow to encapsulate not just the music of their culture, but seem somehow to encapsulate their culture through their music. And these kind of interactions are what are interesting me at the moment. So that's from the general. Let's look at something a little bit more specific here. Um, some numbers and some perspectives. Uh, in 1904, the Yiddish poet and union activist Av Avram Radutsky, who had moved to Glasgow from Kiev, Gubernia um, in the late 19th century, he was a poet and he was uh, a cigarette worker. He formed the first cigarette workers union in Scotland in the early 20th century and he maintained uh, an irregular, semi-regular um, correspondence uh, as the Scottish correspondent for the St. Petersburg paper um, de, uh, defined, um, and he used to sign his letter. He was a kind of Yiddish Alistair Cook. <laughs> he used to sign his uh, correspondence, brief from Scotland uh, or brief from Glasgow, letter from Scotland or letter from Glasgow. In 1904, in one of these briefs, uh, he described the Jewish population of Glasgow as uh, a tropenwasser in yam, just a mere drop in the ocean. 
nevertheless, by 1920, there were around about 15,000 Jews in Scotland, and that number would rise still more over the next decade. Glasgow's largest area of Jewish settlement, uh, and Glasgow itself was the largest area of Jewish settlement, and its largest area of Jewish settlement was the Gorbals on the south side of the city, where Jews negotiated often fairly cramped community with other immigrant groups like Irish, uh, Poles, Lithuanians, uh, Highland, Gaelic speaking Highlanders, Italians, and so on. Now, the Gorbals had the dubious distinction of being frequently referred to as one of Europe's worst slums, um, but also this kind of um, rich, uh, heterogeneous immigrant mix elicited some very evocative uh, and inevitably romanticised descriptions. This is one of my favourite from the uh, wonderful Scottish writer Lewis Grassett Gibbon. He wrote, this is a little bit later, he was writing in the early 30s here, writing about the Gorbals and particularly bringing out uh, the Jewish side of the Gorbals. And I'm going to read this, have a listen to how he kind of highlights things which are um, kind of Scottish and then uh, extremely un-Scottish, uh, deliberately so. So uh, Gibbon writes about the Gorbals, it is lovably and abominably and delightfully and hideously un-Scottish. It is not even a Scottish slum. Stout men in beards and ringlets and unseemly attire lounge and strut with pointed shoes. You definitely get the feeling those Scots would ever be lounging and strutting. Ruth and Naomi go by with downcast eastern faces. The Lascar rubs shoulders with the Syrian. Harry Lauder is a bow, unkeened to the midnight stars. In the air, the stench is of a different quality to Govans or Kamlakis, a better quality. It is not filth and futility and boredom unrelieved. It is haunted by an ancient ghost of goodness and grossness, sun warmed and ripened under alien suns. It is the most saving slum in Glasgow and the most abandoned. So with that description in your mind, we're going to listen in now to three examples. We're going to listen in um, on three locations in the Gorbals. And I've just realised that when I was sharing my screen, I didn't share sound. So I'm just going to come out for a second. I can see you all there. Hello. And let's share again. And this time I will share my sound and then we should be away again. Um, okay, so here's where we're going to look. This is a little snatch of the Gorbals here, and we're going to look at three locations, just a few streets away from each other. South Portland Street, um, Oxford Street, or the corner of Oxford Street, and Buchan Street, and Dunmore Street. So um, in the top bit there you can see here, this is the River Clyde, uh, this is the railway coming across, and this is the south side of the city, the Gorbals. And these three locations I think what's interesting is that they connect the Gorbals outwards through music. So we're going to have a little, a little eavesdrop here. The first place we're eavesdropping is on the sounds of prayer in the synagogue itself. And we're going to listen to Mayor Fomin. Fomin was a cantor. He was uh, born in Vitebsk in Russia and he moved as a young teenager to live with his grandfather in Riga. Um, around the same time he was touring Eastern Europe as a uh, a boy cantor as a kind of star cantor. This was a fairly common thing for cantors to do. Um, it was a way of uh, kind of connecting into national and transnational um, synagogue uh, networks. Um, it was a way of learning and disseminating new repertoire and it was obviously a way of making some money as well. Um, and so you'll often find advertisements, in fact we have some in Scotland as well, uh, uh, you'll find advertisements for um, star cantors coming to lead uh, you know, to Davin on uh, on Saturday or on Friday night and uh, lead services and Foman did this. Um, so uh, he trained in Riga and then in Warsaw and then in 1922 um, a planned trip to Chicago to become a fur dealer with his brothers-in-law was aborted when he took up the position of cantor of South Portland Street Synagogue in the Gorbals. Um, South Portland Street was the largest synagogue in Glasgow. It wasn't the oldest um, or necessarily the grandest, but it was the largest. And Fomin served that congregation for the next 30 years. We're going to listen to Fomin's own composition of Avinu Malkainu. Um, and for those of you who know the famous version, you will hear similarities, but you will hear a much stronger Eastern European cast to the melody. And this is what I like, and I, I think I find this interesting because it kind of connects um, the Glasgow Jewish, Gorbals Jewish population 
with its Eastern European roots and that happens through through the music. So we're going to have a listen to this. I'll just put someone on. Um, I'm going to start playing now. If you can't hear it, please, uh, you know, wave your hand or something. Or just maybe, Tony, you could give me a thumbs up if you can hear. Uh, music's coming now. just for time i'm sorry to interrupt such uh, such beautiful singing such beautiful music i had a little bit of that's from a recording that Fomin made uh, in london in the 20s i added a little bit of uh, revo a bit of echo there to give us a sound that we were maybe actually listening in um, on a on a yom kippur service perhaps sometime in the early 1920s the next bit of sound we're going to hear happens on the corner of oxford street and buckham street it comes from the hazen there um, of the hevra kadisha shul um, and this is Isaac Hershov, who was also born in Vitebsk, also trained in Warsaw, and came to the Gorbals just one year after Mayor Fomin. Um, Hershov was a little bit more upwardly mobile, and he, uh, it, three years after arriving in the Gorbals, he uh, nipped smartly across the River Clyde uh, to Garnet Hill Synagogue, which is Glasgow's um, most uh, grand and imposing um, synagogue. It was the first purpose-built shul in, uh, in Glasgow. Uh, in Scotland indeed, um, and it was a much more anglicised community, but we're going to listen, uh, imagine ourselves when Hershov is still in the Gorbals. Um, just one little bit more information you need is that uh, in the 1930s Isaac Hershov enrolled on the newly inaugurated music degree at the University of Glasgow and in fact in 1938 became the university's first ever graduate in music and as part of his uh, degree he produced a beautiful cantata based on a number of Hebrew prayers, including Minhamet Sa. And with this cantata, he kind of brings together uh, the Eastern um, Chazanut of his training and Western classical structures. Um, and we have documents that show that Hershov began this piece of music when he had just arrived in Scotland. So I'm kind of imagining him in Hebrew Kaddisha synagogue dreaming up this music, but we're going to listen to a slightly more complete version. This is the beginning of the second movement of Isaac Hershov's cantata. Uh, the cantata is called The Hope of Israel. <laughs> Once again, just for time, I'm going to move on to my last little snippet. Um, incidentally, if that piqued anyone's interest, uh, that that has that wasn't an actual performance. That was a mock-up that I made of his cantata. If that piqued anyone's interest, uh, Hershel's music is going to be part of a BBC concert uh, later in the year, celebrating uh, 
um, forgotten composers I managed to get in onto that scheme. So if you liked that, then look out for a little plug for Isaac Herschel and his music. OK, we're going to finish off um, with a narrative, a kind of self-constructed narrative um, by Louis Freeman. Um, he was a band leader, a pianist, a musical director, uh, entrepreneur. Uh, he was kind of self-dubbed as Glasgow's Mr. Music. And Freeman um, was born uh, in Scotland, uh, moved at a very young age uh, to the Gorbals. His father was a trebler, which is um, a, a traveling salesman, a peddler, essentially began as a, a draper, as a fabric uh, peddler, and then moved to being a jewelry peddler by the time that this narrative takes place. Um, we're going to just listen to a couple of minutes of Louis Freeman telling his musical life story. And what I find interesting about this and what I want you to listen for is the way that the story expands geographically outwards and it does so through music. Um, so it begins with Louis being born, well actually moving as a young child to Dunmore Street in the Gorbals. So he's very much, and you'll hear about him talking about his very bounded um, Jewish musical education at this point, and then it moves outwards to the centre of Glasgow with his more formal musical training at the uh, the Athenaeum, the Conservatoire of Glasgow. Um, you'll then hear him as he uh, connects through kind of commercial networks, you'll hear his story move across Scotland and throughout uh, all of Glasgow and into Edinburgh. And finally, with the orchestras that he used to put on the boats, you'll hear his story move over the Atlantic and become very international. At the same time, and what's very clear from Freeman's own narrative, is that he himself considers himself moving from a kind of bounded internal Jewish life to, into a wider commercial world, but also, you'll hear at the end, upwards uh, through kind of social class. From the son of, uh, of a trebler, of a peddler, uh, you will hear that by the end he's mixing with the creme de la creme. So let's just listen for a couple of minutes. And we'll finish with Louis Freeman. As a young boy, we moved to Dunmore Street from the south side and I always had a very good voice. My mother had a, a brother who was a very famous cantor in Poland. His name was Alexander Erslav. So my mother got me a Hebrew teacher to teach me Hebrew and the, the Gemara so that I could translate the Hebrew into song, and I know what I was singing. Uh, my mentor was a, the, the Reverend Weinstone, cantor of the Hebrew Kedusha Shul in the south side of Glasgow. And he started me, I was in the choir. And when I was 10 or 11, he taught me to officiate on the Friday night. When I became about 13, 14, my mother wrote to her brother that my voice was breaking, what should I do? So he advised me to take up the clavier, which is the piano in German. I did so well that when I was 15, I went to the Athenaeum, which is now called the Royal Scottish Academy of Music. And in the fourth year, I won the Bechstein Gold Medal in 1912. I won the gold medal plus 10 pounds, which was a lot of money in that time. See, I was going to be a concert pianist. But then I got, uh, I got a telegram if I would come and play for a concert party in Girvan, which is Ayrshire, 1912. And my salary was three pounds a week. And my mother objected to me, but I was very strong. Anyhow, I did very well there. And then instead of becoming a contra pianist, I entered the commercial side of music. Then I started becoming a, a, an entrepreneur, a band leader. I had my own bands. Then I became musical director of the Alhambra Theatre of Glasgow, which is now extinct, the Theatre Oil. The, the Pavilion Theatre, the King's Theatre Edinburgh, and I supplied all the bands going to America and India and Canada on the ships. I played all over the whole of Scotland. I played at all the social functions. I've come the cream de cream of Scottish society. See, in fact, 
when I went to these paid at those balls, the butler had an order that a bottle of champagne was placed on the piano. This is for Freeman. See? Okay, and I'm going to stop there and hand over to Mia. Uh, thank you so much. Um, we're going to move from the oral um, to the visual, um, where I'll be talking about um, exhibiting Jewish culture and art in post-war Glasgow. And I'm just going to start off with a little story. Exactly three years ago, in March 2018, I went to the beloved Jewish actor Ida Schuster's home in Gifnick, Glasgow. And it was a very rare opportunity. Ida, who passed away sadly this past year, was about to celebrate her 100th birthday. She'd been a theater actor in both the Jewish theater and professional worlds, a director and a key cultural figure in the Glasgow arts community. And I'd been investigating Jewish culture in Scotland as part of the HRC funded project on Scottish Jewish migration with Hannah and Phil. Ich bin an Archiv, Ida Schuster said to me with a knowing look and an impish smile, her arms spread wide, welcoming me to delve into the pages of her life. But unlike unto other interviewers, I had come to her home not to find out about her life in the theater. I was there to gain insight into one very grand festival of Jewish art that took place in Glasgow in 1951 in which Ida had played a key role. And I'm just gonna share my screen. Uh, to tell you a little bit about it. Um, the Festival of Jewish Arts in Glasgow, which was Britain's second city at the time, was conceived as a response to and time to coincide with the much larger Festival of Britain in 1951. Glasgow's Jewish Festival was the first and the largest festival specifically dedicated to Jewish art in the UK. It was privately funded by the Jewish community and held in Glasgow from the 4th to the 25th of February, 1951. And remarkably, the displays showcased works from over 50 internationally renowned Jewish artists, including Marc Chagall, Camille Pissarro, Amadeo Modigliani, Chaim Soutin, Jacob Epstein, Joseph Herman, and Yanko Adler. On display as well were antiquities dating back from the 13th century. There were films, musical performances, a display of 2,000 books, and lectures by artists Joseph Herman and renowned philosopher Martin Buber. There, were also, there was also a run of sellout performances of S. Anski's The Dibbuk, the 1914 play about a girl possessed by the spirit of her dead lover by Glasgow's award-winning Jewish Institute players. It was there, there that Ida, a well-established actor in her 30s at the time, played the lead role of Leia to rave reviews. I had many questions for Ida that afternoon. Why an art festival? What audience was it aimed at? And why in Glasgow? And more importantly, what does it tell us about what was important to the leaders of the Jewish community at that time? My theory was that the festival, much like the characters in the Dibbuk play, was haunted by the undead spirit of Jewish life cut short by the devastation of the Holocaust and also influenced by the recent establishment of the state of Israel and the promise of the renewal of culture. Ida was quick to put me, me and my theory in its place. Academics like to put things into neat little boxes, she admonished. That's not how it was. How was it then? Well, like any historical event, it would be difficult to know exactly how the Festival of Arts was and for whom. There is some evidence of its nature, a program which you see here in the Scottish Jewish Archives Center, one copy of the exhibition guide, an art catalog at the National Library of Scotland, 
and some opening speeches and reviews in Glasgow's Jewish newspaper, The Jewish Echo. There were brief mentions in a couple of other Scottish newspapers of the time. But there are no critical analyses of the festival. There's not much historical information on it, no record of attendance, although the Echo does refer to uh, the fact that 10,000 visitors came, which was a considerable amount. There are no floor plans and few people alive remember the event aside from Ida, who I had interviewed about it. And yet from a wider Jewish cultural studies perspective, the festival provides a rare opportunity to look at a particular post-war performance of Jewish art. And in many ways, it illuminates the ways in which local ethnic performances are rooted in a social and political moment. More importantly, it broadens our understandings of how these performances respond to historically fraught issues such as migration, belonging, otherness, nationalism, and how minorities construct themselves and their identities in respect to mainstream culture. So with this issues in, these issues in mind, I'll very briefly look at what um, scholar Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimlet has called the performance of display at the Jewish Art Festival, especially within post-World War II social and political context, in order to probe how social and political anxieties about Jewish migration and anti-Semitism may have influenced organizers and their exhibition of Jewish culture. So key to my analysis um, is the distinction between an exhibition and a festival, especially in regard to what we might call minority festivals or ethnic minority festivals. According to Kirschenbach Gimlet, both exhibitions and festivals display a performance of ethnic identification for minority groups. A festival, however, unlike a museum exhibit, has an aspect of pure theatricality. In other words, festivals, according to Kirschenbach Gimlet, I'm quoting, depend on the performative to synthesize and encapsulate a simplified idea of what that ethnic group wants to be and how they want to represent themselves. Because festivals are so compressed, they are also intensely political moments, which is what makes this particular event in Glasgow significant for a study in post-war British Jewish culture. So what is so special about Glasgow as a location and this particular festival and its events? So this was not the first only, or it was not the only large Jewish art exhibition that had been held in Britain. There was an important section of the Anglo-Jewish historical exhibition of 1887 in London that featured artworks. And 10 years later, the Whitechapel Art Gallery in London held its first major Jewish exhibition dedicated solely to art in 1906 called Jewish Art and Antiquities with 2000 works. But when the chair and organizer Benno Schultz opened the Festival of Jewish Arts on the 9th of February, he declared the time had been considered ripe for Jews to take stock of their cultural achievements and to see where they stood in relation to the general stream of culture for the benefit of themselves and their children. So why was the time ripe? For one thing, as mentioned, the Festival of Britain was to take place that summer. And its goal was to highlight the nation and its peoples. According to Schuss's memoir, the Jews of Glasgow wanted to assert its own idea of how it fit among the peoples and that nation. Held to mark the centenary of the Great Exhibition of 1851, the Festival of Britain, which used 11 million pounds of public funds at a time of near national bankruptcy, was deeply enmeshed in post-war concerns about British identity. Famously described by its director, Sir Gerald Barry, as a tonic to the nation, held thousands of events all over the country and more than people visited the main festival site in London on the south bank of the Thames River. 
And indeed, in the media decade following World War II, Britain saw a surge of support for the arts and festivals. It was the time when the Edinburgh International Festival was founded in 1947, as well as the Arts Council in 1945. Public lectures, study groups, educational books aimed at the general public all enjoyed increased increase support as well. Evidence that Glasgow's Jewish community took part in a cultural and educational zeitgeist is clear from the records and pamphlets held at the Scottish Jewish Archive Centre in Glasgow. It's not one of the largest Jewish populations in Britain, but it was certainly one of the most active. There were a number of weekly study groups, book clubs, lectures, an active theatre group, men's and women's clubs, dances and socials. Uh, it was also home to a widely successful award-winning Jewish theatre group, the Jewish Institute Players, led by Avram Greenberg, Greenbaum. Um, but it was also a community constantly shifting demographics due to migration, which makes this a noteworthy case study as well. Although there has been a Jewish community in Scotland since the 18th century, at the turn of the century, Scotland had a Jewish population of 4,000. By 1911, this grew to 12,000. And then, um, and then a third influx of refugees fleeing from Nazism saw this number grow to 20,000 by mid-century. And now it's actually back down to about 5,000. With while only 3% of Britain's Jewish population, the influx of migrants brought an extraordinary number of Jewish artists to Glasgow. Aside from sculptor Ben Schultz, who came from Estonia in 1912 and was the head of sculpture and ceramic at the Glasgow School of Art, there were also a number of influential painters who were either immigrants or came as refugees in the 1930s to 40s, such as Joseph Herman and Yankel Adler, and both left the city in 1943. Schutz and Adler had even held a successful earlier exhibition at the Jewish Institute in Glasgow in 1942, entitled Jewish Art. But in terms of the politics of exhibiting Jewish art in post-war Britain, Glasgow's Festival of Jewish Arts had an interest in downplaying the Jewish refugee image that was so prevalent in the media at the time. Its aim was to outline very clearly how Jews and Jewish artists could contribute to an international pluralist vision of British culture. Organizers made this clear in letters and press releases that the art world could provide an entry point to, to explain Jewishness in a way that was palatable to the intended audience of non-Jewish spectators and to influence how Jewishness was constructed. To quote Schutz's memoir, the festival attracted the attention of the non-Jewish public to the cultural contribution of the Jews to the world at a time when it was needed. And perhaps what was needed was an intervention into stereotypes of Jews in the British media, including impressions that Jews were wandering refugees and victims on the one hand, and economic powerhouses and political agitators on the other, whether for communism, capitalism, or Zionism. It was an image that was buttressed by the arrival of 60,000 Jewish refugees from Germany to Britain during the late 1930s. Jews, as historian Tony Kushner observes, were news, and Jewish issues were common in public discourse, literature, and the press. A positive spin on that news could perhaps facilitate naturalization for Jewish refugees in Britain, as well as garner support for the fledgling state of Israel. What's also evident is there was a good deal of self-consciousness and ambivalence about making those goals of the festival patent. The Scotsman reported that at a press conference that organizer Ben Ashot said that the Festival of Jewish Arts was not intended to present Zionist propaganda. It was to be judged on its own merits as it was purely a cultural enterprise. The art exhibit selections too tended to evade the more obvious wandering Jew themes and images that were nevertheless key in Jewish art, key to Jewish art of that period. And when you think of Chagall and Joseph Herman, Schultz and Adler, they all created some of their most famous works of the period around the themes of the Jewish refugees. But these, as we see in the 
in the list here were notably not on display. In a close examination of the exhibition guide, one can uncover a Jewish cultural heritage that combined a refined Central European high culture with the ancient Jewish past of a somewhat hesitant embrace of old world Eastern Europe. And while, like Ida, some had qualms about overtly highlighting issues around Jeff Jewish refugees and victimhood at what was supposed to be a celebration of culture, Neither could one sidestep the recent murder of the Jews by the Nazis without disrespecting the memory of the victims. A closer look at the program booklets reveals multiple mentions of art lost, music silenced, synagogues and artifacts destroyed, publishing houses and libraries burned, and the lives of a new generation of producers of Jewish culture cut short. If one reads the Festival of Jewish Arts program booklets as ideological and political texts, one can see the lines of conflict between exhibiting and celebrating a vibrant Jewishness, while at the same time memorializing the recent loss of culture in Europe. Maybe supporting my haunting theory more than Ida um, could attest, there were reminders and mentions of the Holocaust and the devastation it wrought in virtually every section of the program booklet and explanatory notes of the exhibition guides, even if subtly. So just to conclude, when Glasgow's uh, Festival of Jewish Arts closed on Sunday, 2nd of March at 6 p.m., it was the, with the singing of Israel's national anthem, Hatikva. The festival was a tremendous success with over 10,000 registered visitors and the organizers could perhaps in fact claim that they had shared an important aspect of Jewish contribution to the arts with the Scottish public. As the editor of the Echo reported, the exhibition was designed purely as an artistic event, yet we cannot but be impressed by the great value of such a display in our relations with our non-Jewish neighbors. The value placed on the festival's capacity to smooth interfaith relations at the same time belies a sense of vulnerability felt by members of Glasgow's populace as they stood at a turning point in their self-construction as Scottish and British Jews in a post-Holocaust world. Thank you. And I yeah, time for questions uh, for all of us, probably. Thank you very much. Sorry, my cat has joined us for the Q and A. <laughs> Thank you so much for an interesting paper. Um, we have a short amount of time for a Q and A, and if we do run out of time, please feel free to drop your messages into an email, and I'll make sure that we can get some answers to you. Okay, so let's start with a question for Peter. Tony asks, where can Jewish burial records be found for Cork? Are they online or is this an archive trip required? Uh, no, they're not online. It's um, in, they're kept with uh, a for, um, the daughter of a former member of the community who's since deceased. Um, if the person wants to email me, I can give her him her uh, details to, so he can contact her. Unfortunately, it would require a trip to Cork though. I don't think that's unfortunate. It's a lovely place. <laughs> that's great. Thank you. I'll make sure that those connections are made after the session. Um, okay, for Phil has already addressed this in the chat box. So thank you, Phil. Um, Peter, then, do you know anything about um, Jewish music in the historic Irish Cork communities? Um, Percy Diamond, um, whose son Alec Diamond la died only last year, became the unofficial cantor of the of the synagogue. And um, following, uh, towards the end of uh, Rabbi Bedil's uh, time in Cork in the early sixties, when I interviewed Rabbi Bedil um, in Manchester in twenty sixteen. Um, he told me that music had become in the latter years a big part of the, the service of Cork and they actually prepared music together 
um, I asked him would he play some of this for me and he wasn't prepared he was too embarrassed at this stage but at that stage in his life but he said um it had become a big feature of the of the ceremonies uh, and the uh, uh, the uh, events in the synagogue in the latter years of as I said the last rabbi um who at the time was reverend by deal up to 1963. Uh, Percy I think in his early life had been an opera singer Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, just one more question then for you. Um, what are your thoughts on why this accidental arrival narrative emerged in the first place and why it was strongly embedded in the collective memory of the court community generations later? And that's a message from Kai. Um, like everything, it's hard to say, you know, there are many, you know, there are many different reasons why it could have become embedded um, in the core community. It is part of the narrative for several other peripheral communities in, in, in Britain as well. And I have actually heard it in the States as well in relation to other, uh, other communities. So um, a lot of things would point to the um, anti-immigration sentiment that arose in Britain towards the end of the 19th century with the arrival of thousands of um, immigrants from Eastern Europe, from Russia, which ultimately led to the Aliens Act in 1905, which limited um, in particular Jewish immigration to Great Britain and to Ireland. Um, however, if you could prove uh, even after the 1905 Aliens Act that you were a refugee, that you were fleeing, um, it was a way to nevertheless um, uh, acquire um, uh, status within the country. Some people, some historians would suggest as well um, that as we saw a lot of the sh some of the ships, as I pointed out, you know, broke down. They did accidentally arrive in Cork. There was this in Britain and in Ireland, and this anti-immigration uh, sentiment. And maybe people felt that, you know, by saying they had arrived accidentally, they were refugees that made more people, people more amenable to the fact that they were going to settle in, in Britain and Ireland because it wasn't seen as directly as their fault. Um, the uh, maybe a more complicated uh, answer would the Belgian oral, oral historian Jan van Sina, who's done a lot of work on, on oral histories, and this is predominantly an oral history. Um, and it's, as I said, a narrative that's been passed from generation to generation, believes that as the original descendants of the community die and the, the story is passed to the next generation, elements are obviously lost and the story you know becomes packaged and it becomes easier to remember so important features such as you know ships breaking down are lost in the narrative and it eventually becomes this story that is packaged and easy to tell from one person to the next so which i think could also have played a role in cork but it's important to say that this narrative doesn't just appear in relation to Cork. The Cork community defines itself on it. However, it ha I have come across it in relation to other Anglo-Jewish uh, communities as well. Excellent. Thank you very much. Tony, you had your hand up. Would you like to unmute and ask your question if you still have one? No? Okay. Well, just to say, first of all, I very much enjoyed the, uh, the narrative tonight. The speakers, thank you for your research. I'm in Cardiff in Wales, a Londoner living in Cardiff. We had the same story of uh, people coming from the Pale, from Russia, being told they were in America. My wife's grandmother was the kosher butcher here. She landed here and didn't see her brothers for many years. They came one at a time with a suitcase and a label around their neck. And we were told they were in America. Um, this is how the Board of Guardians was developed, a group of Jew, local Jewish people to help young people who arrived here with nothing. And they became carers for this now called the Cardiff Jewish Helpline. But th at that time, it was known as the Board of Guardians and they looked after children. So that fits in quite well with the story. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mark asks, do Glasgow and Edinburgh do you support particular football teams? Uh, 
Is that something that someone, one of the one of the trio, can you answer that for us? Any insights? Do you mean do they support particular do Edinburgh Jews support a particular Edinburgh team, and do Glasgow Jews support a particular Glasgow team? Um, Perhaps you'd like to unmute Mark if you have anything extra to add to your question. Well, the, the uh, main football teams are in both towns a Catholic and Catholic team or a minor team, which is neither. Yes, um, I'm not. I, I have a uh, anecdotally, I would say that Jews in Glasgow support Rangers, but that's only anecdotally. I'm not sure there is actual uh, tribal allegiance. The, um, you know, also anecdotally. Jews were quite often um, left out of, uh, you know, secular rivalry on the basis that they were neither Catholic nor Protestant. So they kind of got in under the wire there. Um, but I would say um, that in Glasgow, uh, the majority of Glasgow Jews that I know uh, are Rangers fans, are Jambos rather than, uh, rather than Celtic fans, Celtic fans. Thank you very much. Um, I think that I've made a note of everybody's question, but if I have missed you off, please do free to drop it back into the into the chat box now. We've got a couple more minutes. It's going over just by a few minutes. I hope that's okay with everybody. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, if anybody has any questions they want to pop in now, then we still have some time. No? Okay. In which case, thank you very much for two very excellent papers. It was fantastic to cover so much geography in a short time. So just to draw everyone's attention to our session tomorrow morning at 10.30 a.m., a noble response by Jews of all classes. This is a session about the We Were There Two British Jews in the First World War project presented by Alan Fell. And then in the evening, using the same link as you'll be sent out in the morning at 6 p.m. is Cyber Heritage, Jewish Heritage, Jew Jewish History rather, in Social Space. And that's the Connecting Small Histories Through Social Media and Archives presented by myself and Lily's Legacy, Voices and Visuals of Liberal Judaism presented by Mike Beryl and Sue Temple. I hope you'll join us to learn some more about Jew heritage tomorrow. Until then, take care, everybody. And thanks again to our wonderful speakers. Good night.